So the first thing we have to do is give a round of applause to the caterer because that was a great lunch. And I should tell you that I got here because um, I was born in Brooklyn <laughs> and still live there. Uh, everybody who's not from Brooklyn, raise your hand. Oh, well, there are people in the rest of the world. Uh, I'm also here because um, I'm uh, in charge of speaking today about food that we actually eat, um, as opposed to some of the other things that we've been looking at, at in, the, in the future. Uh, I run a global consulting company. Uh, you'd know us best because we created and operated uh, Windows on the World until uh, somebody flew an airplane into it. Uh, and uh, we also created and operated the Rainbow Room on top of Rockefeller Center and uh, three of the world's uh, first food courts. So we're a, we're a giant firm and work around the world. Uh, the firm consists of two of us. Uh, so you, you're looking at half the firm, and the other half of the firm is my brilliant genius wife, uh, Roseanne Gold, who's a four-time uh, James Beard Award winner. Um, so um, we're supposed to know something about food. And um, hello? Um, I'm very tightly scripted because I have 40 minutes worth of material to cram into 20. Uh, so uh, you'll pardon me if I do a little bit of reading. Uh, I've been asked by the Bitten people to explain where food trends come from, since that's my subject today. And the simple answer is, damned if I know. <laughs> or anyone else does either. And, and I don't mean to be flip because trends come from everywhere. Um, and every time a new food blog comes out, a new trend is born. Um, and I'm reminded uh, of a New York Times article last year uh, where one of their business people uh, attempted to define trends by how often certain foods were mentioned in the Wednesday food section. Uh, and he produced a big chart showing how food trends rose and, and fell for kale and Brussels sprouts and things like that. Um, and it was visually very interesting and really quite incorrect. Uh, <laughs> Because it's the New York Times, so they came late to the party. Oh, we discovered kale. Um, and, and then they left the party early because they're journalists. So, the, you know, oh, we've already written about it. Let's go on to something else. Uh, so uh, if you read the Times, there's one set of trends. And if you um, read Google, there's another kinds of trends. And we publish a 15-page uh, a trends letter every year. Uh, that gets picked, around, picked up around the world. Um, so mapping trends is a, a precarious business. Um, and, but that's what we do when we're not uh, running around the world creating restaurants. Um, so I'm going to run through some trends today. Building restaurants uh, in oddball locations probably is not a trend. Um, eclairs were hot for about six months last year. Uh, and then a shop selling nothing but eclairs uh, opened in Lower Manhattan. And this eclair is filled with wasabi pea dressing and a dash of smoked salmon. Uh, the play's closed in about four weeks. Uh, we have a saying in our company that a classic restaurant is one that lasts the length of its lease. Um, and this one surely didn't. Um, I'd have bet against this, uh, this cereal concept uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, but it's, it's past the first year and it still lives. And, you know, a lot of people probably would not have put money on a meatball shop, uh, but there it is, good for them. Um, they've entrenched meatballs in menus around the country. So if you prowl your supermarket snack aisle, you'll find all sorts of new savory snack combinations. Uh, and this one's from Japan. We're on the cutting edge of this uh, kind of craziness. Uh, but these Japanese flavors, when they take hold, uh, end up here. Um, now, I don't think I would have put money on this sort of place. Um, <laughs> but it was a short-term trend in Southeast Asia. Um, quite honestly, it, it, it soon went down the toilet. <laughs> uh, but the truth is that trends come from everywhere. and. Um, for almost the last decade, our company has been looking for trends in the um, world of coffee and the world of chocolate. 
uh, because what was going on there was uh, a forecast of what was happening, would happen in the rest of the world. And today we're looking at uh, packaged snacks from around the world, like the one I just showed you. Uh, we're looking at the battle of shelf space uh, in the beverage aisles for super, in supermarkets and what's going on in the world of cocktails and booze. So I'm going to rattle off very quickly uh, 20 trends in 20 minutes, and if I go over, I'm told I'll be yanked off and you'll only get 18 trends. <laughs> so uh, snicker, if you must, uh, but this improbable push cart in Vancouver has evolved into a small brick and mortar chain, and it represents what our company calls restless palate syndrome. We're talking about the irresistible compunction compulsion to exaggerate the flavor profiles of today's foods and to layer a cacophony of clashing flavors. You can say that four times. Cacophony of clashing flavors onto what we eat. Um, it's a game of extreme eating. For example, you're all f aware of the trend toward ever darker, ever bitter or chocolate. Um, and in this sense, bitter uh, represents a maturation of the American palate. And bitter chocolate has opened the pathways to uh, extreme flavor overlays in other foods. And it's opened the door uh, for all of us to eat more bitter edibles, things you now take for granted, but 10 or 15 years ago you would have pushed to the edge of your plate, um, like broccoli rob, uh, or arugula, or kale, or watercress. So I'll give you a heads up. Um, the next uh, bitter uh, food will be fresh horseradish and not just for gefilte fish. So here you have an example of how trendy flavors are being overlaid onto all already trendy foodstuffs. Um, this may be a little silly, but there's a lot of it, and we'll talk more about it in, in a few minutes. Uh, bitter matcha, which is powdered green tea, is showing up here in a cappuccino, but it's also going into poaching liquids, into flavored oils, into breakfast pancakes, into breadsticks and desserts. Uh, we used it years ago as a finishing salt in an upscale Japanese restaurant. Um, and now there's a, ma a matcha bar serving nothing but matcha drinks. And where would it be? Brooklyn. Where? Brooklyn. where? Williamsburg. Williamsburg, right. <laughs> <laughs> but we're moving beyond pleasantly bitter uh, into repulsively bitter. <laughs> These are Amari which are in Italy are drunk straight after a meal as punishment for excess enjoyment. <laughs> uh, and they're becoming vital ingredients uh, in all sorts of cocktails today. Uh, bitter liqueurs are finding their way very quietly also um, into the kitchen, uh, in sauces, in marinades, in dressings, and so are old-fashioned botanicals. They used to be called grandmother's drinks, chartreuse, maraschino, a benedictine. Uh, all of these are a little sweet, uh, but they all have bitter botanical profiles. So bitter is important. Um, we're moving beyond plain old beer, uh, hence the boom in IPAs, which are bitter. Uh, we're adding beer to cocktails um, and cocktails uh, to beer. This is a margarita with, uh, uh, with its ingredients added uh, to a splash of beer, and it's called a beer garita. Uh, I did not make that up. Um, and I, I can tell you a Bloody Mary, Mary with beer, uh, for some reason, is a big seller. Uh, there's a, you want to Google a word called Michaledis, um, because it's showing how we become a, a, a nation of flavor junkies. Michaledis uh, originated in Mexico, and basically it's a beer that you add all sorts of uh, ingredients to, from Tabasco sauce to Worcestershire sauce uh, to... Um, whiskey. Uh, and by the way, the, the same hops that make beer bitter uh, is now going into vodka and brown whiskey. So here we have two trends in one. We're showing a margarita with the addition of yellow chartreuse, which is a sweet, bitter liqueur, topped with finely shaved ice flavored with cinnamon sugar, and it turns a classic drink into something approaching dessert. Uh, we're also seeing lots of ice creams and shakes boozed up with the liqueur, as I, I noted uh, just a minute ago. And one reason for this is to add adult gratification to childhood treats. And the other goes back to the term I just used. Uh, we've become a nation of flavor junkies. Um, 
And uh, <laughs> this is what I do when I'm doing too much research. Uh, you should know that um, our palates are shifting from sweet to savory. Uh, this is a, a very big trend in, uh, in the United States and Europe, moving from sweet to savory. Uh, so these vegetable yogurts uh, made by Blue Hill at Stone Barns uh, made a big splash. Uh, haagen in Japan is selling vegetable ice creams. Uh, and uh, in Rome, uh, there are some artisan gelati uh, shops that are selling gelati made with gorgonzola cheese, uh, with pistachio and, uh, and uh, mortadella, gorgonzola, uh, even anchovies and smoked salmon. Um, it's not exactly my taste, but one gelateria also serves them with beer pairings. And right on cue, Hershey last week uh, bought up a company that makes this jerky. Now, you have to ask yourself why. Um, the answer is because they also see the shift from sweet to savory, and they need to get ahead of the curve. Uh, you'll also note here how Crave, which is the name of the, the brand of this jerky, is creating its own wacky flavor overlays, as if regular jerky weren't intensely flavored enough. So I say here that we're moving from comfort to discomfort. I'll explain what I mean by that. If you think about melted cheese on the hamburger, it gives the hamburger a comfortable mouthfeel. Uh, butter on toast gives you a comforting mouthfeel. Uh, these are flavor overlays that complement each other the way cream does with bitter coffee. But topping a hamburger with uh, blistering kimchi, for example, uh, short circuits, I missed one, our tastes. We lost the slide, folks. Um, but there are kimchi burgers being served around town uh, that uh, just make your neurons go nuts. Um, and so here are some other examples of um, things that make your, your neurons and your taste buds go nuts. Uh, this one just proves that nothing is sacred. <laughs> um, here Japan meets Mexico in a, in a cross-cultural mashup. And you can see kind of a slippery slope developing here. Um, Squid, kimchi, steak, tartare, it's a bit demented. Um, <laughs> but it's full of jangling flavors. And, and that's what this chef uh, is really after. He's going to get your attention one way or another. And here we are at, at the very bottom of that slope. Uh, from the name of this dish, you might well conclude that um, we can't leave well enough alone. Um, and you'd be correct. Uh, this last slide says, that we're, says we're at the global crossroad. And this slide. This slide is perfect, purposely hard to read because I want to insult, assault your, your visual neurons the way the mashups I just showed you uh, assault your gastro-nervous neurons. We're in an era of what we call unruly food, food that breaks all the rules that chefs lar learned in cooking schools, food that knows no boundaries, food that is pur purposely disharmonious, food that thumbs its notion, nose at the notion of uh, authenticity. These are pretty exciting times. Again, we can't leave well enough in all, alone. I know this isn't a conference about booze, but I said earlier it pays to carefully watch what's happening in beverages, and this is an example. On the one hand, there's a trend towards upscale brown whiskey in the United States, and on the other hand, we see increasing amounts of corrupting flavors being added to the same booze. Um, pumpkin pie, spices, cinnamon, honey, maple syrup, tea, ginger. Um, there's a company, where is it? In Brooklyn. <laughs> adding hops, the hops that makes beer bitter, they're adding it to brown whiskey. And very shortly, you'll see uh, a bottle of Jim Beam infused with Scotch whiskey. It's a Franken beverage if there ever was one. Um, mixologists are having a good time con concocting good for you cocktails on the theory that you can drink yourself into good health and become beautiful at the same time. Uh, so we see uh, guarana, acai, uh, goji berries, green tea, elderberry, pomegranate, hibiscus, um, acerola, they're all being uh, used as today's bartender's buzzwords. Uh, and these similar ingredients are moving from the bar even into fast food beverages. So looking good rises to the top of the menu. 
um, in France, uh, for reasons I can't begin to explain, uh, young people are mixing wine with uh, Coca-Cola. Uh, so uh, apparently uh, this derangement is not confined just to the United States. Uh, we're wrapping up the flavor of honey uh, with blueberry, with chocolate, with mint, with kiwi, and with violently hot chili peppers. Uh, honey may be a food from the Bible, but this proves again that we can't leave well enough alone and nothing is sacred. Uh, chili pepper uh, added to this uh, wild turkey bourbon with honey uh, is why they call the brand Sting. And... Um, you may have had one of the great juices from lunch today, uh, spiked with uh, hot pepper. I thought it was terrific. And speaking of chili pepper, say hello to this year's juicy, uh, spiciest trend, food trend. It's from Calabria, where great chilies are grown. It's called Induya, and it consists of unmentionable parts of pigs that are ground up finely with spices, especially hot Calabrian pepper, and then smoked. Um, you can spread this like Nutella onto pizza. Uh, you can whisk it into a pasta sauce. You can sneak it into a sauce for halibut uh, or use it as we did recently in a restaurant uh, as a glaze for pork chops. Uh, it's this year's hot stuff. Uh, uh, earlier today, you saw somebody describing the uh, uh, generational derivation of, of a burger. Uh, I'd like to put to you uh, a rhetorical question, which is, apart from its history, what is the flavor of a Big Mac since we've been talking about flavors? And I submit to you that the flavor of the Big Mac is the sugar in the bun, the pungent salty pickle, the Thousand Island dressing with more pickles, the gooey salty cheese for mouthfeel, and the onions. The hamburger is superfluous. It's merely a carrier. The condiments are the message. So here we have a hamburger as a carrier of uh, Korean toppings. That's my bibimbap burger that I couldn't find before. Uh, the idea of the hamburger here is that the condiments sell the dish. Um, so very quickly, uh, hummus is a carrier, pizza is a carrier, eggs are a carrier, um, and uh, you're going to hear very shortly from uh, people um, on another trend uh, dealing with insects. I call it BuzzFeed. Um, <laughs> And uh, we're, we're uh, you know, four legs good, six legs better. Um, insects seem to be the answer uh, to our source for protein in the future. And um, there's even a restaurant in Portland serving sushi topped with a whole grasshopper. Uh, they're very efficient to grow and harvest these buggy things. Uh, they take a little farmland and they cut down remarkably on cow poop, which we heard about earlier. It takes about 5,500 crickets to make a pound of flour, in case anybody needs to know. And uh, I imagine there'll be some outrage uh, among vegetarians around the globe when they discover that their tortillas have uh, ground up crickets in them. Seaweed is another uh, source of uh, potential protein, and that's coming down the pike. So a couple of quick trends. Um, techn technology is changing everything in, in our business, and as you heard earlier today in the growth of, of plants and synthetic food and, and uh, uh, airsats um, leather, ah, real leather, no animal. Um, and uh, I'm showing Google Glass because uh, you can think about what would happen if you went into a restaurant where somebody had face recognition software in their Google Glass and the server knew immediately who you were, could pick you out in the crowd down in the bar. Uh, and could uh, recognize who uh, beyond your spouse you were in that restaurant with last week. Uh, so that's dangerous. Um, we heard a little bit about 3D printing. Um, it's being confined right now to uh, dessert things like chocolate, but in England they're using 3D printing to create a flower of crushed insects uh, that are then mixed with um, other spices and ground into a flour uh, or into chocolate and, and, and cream cheese to make a paste. Um, Asian flavors are getting hot um, and you should go beyond sriracha and soy sauce because there's a lot of, a lot of ferment going on in Asian spices. Um, ramen is spreading around the world and I'm, uh, I'm Focusing on ramen because in Japan, it's a mildly flavored 
soothing dish, and we're transforming it in this country to pique our Western palates. So you find um, non-Japanese ramen today made with, um, in my research, gravlax, kimchi, foie gras, truffle oil, hot and sour tomato broth, smoked chicken, and Brussels sprouts. I haven't seen one yet with caviar, but it must exist somewhere. So the point of this is that it's open season for renegade add-ins to uh, all kinds of foods, and it's uh, a signifier of America's restless uh, palate syndrome. Um, despite uh, the fabulous juice we had for lunch, um, we see cold-pressed juices shop opening up all around the country by people who've never been in the business before, and uh, they'll probably go uh, the way of the people with those little eclairs in front. Um, but the big gorillas in the business will do, will do very well. So in summary, we have um, four S's and a B, and, and those four S's and a B stand for salty, sweet, spicy, smoky, and bitter. It sounds like a new set of food groups, uh, but whether we're looking at packaged snacks in your supermarkets uh, or sauces and marinades on the shelves or consuming uh, protein jangling desserts um, or researching new tastes, you keep coming up with these flavor profiles. Uh, you may recall that I showed a bathroom themed restaurant at the beginning of this presentation and a wise lecturer said that the best way to sum up is to leave them laughing. So I offer you one more a uh, restaurant, <laughs> men's room. <laughs> and thank you for listening.